Thank you, Jason. Let's uh, stay in the KUAM News uh, Zoom room here. We're going to bring on uh, Dr. Annette uh, David uh, this morning. And thank you for joining us, uh, Doc. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see all of you. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Uh, we definitely are. And uh, Dr. David is the lead epidemiologist for State Epidemiological Outcomes Work Group, Doc. So uh, definitely, I know you guys are doing a data drop at uh, 1030. Did you want to kind of preview that real quick before we move on? Um, I, I, I'm, I think I'll hold off on that okay. so that there's a, a little bit of excitement for the rest of the media <laughs> folks. <laughs> All right. Well, we did send you we some. We all need a little drama in our lives, right? Right. Just only a little, okay? Oh, yeah. uh, I only need a little. <laughs> uh, Doc, I did uh, send you some of the things that we wanted to talk about, so we'll just go ahead and get right into it. And, and I kind of want to start here with um, what do you think that we need to focus on um, as a community to, to exit this surge? Because uh, Dr. Anna said that we will exit this surge when we get down to fewer than 25 cases a day sustained. So what do we have to do, in your opinion, to get there? Well, I wish I had a magic bullet to, to recommend, Chris, but it still goes back to the basics. It's about getting vaccinated, as many of us as possible, and it's about doing all of the, the measures that we've been living with for the past uh, two, two years, the masking, the social distancing, and the hand washing. I mean, the bottom line really is that with viral dynamics, this will end when there are no more susceptible people left. And, and that's, that's the bottom line. And, and we can get there slowly or we can get there fast. If we want to get there faster, vaccination is the route. But Dr. Ann, it's, it, we're at 89% uh, vaccination. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then uh, I don't know how many uh, um, are left, you know what I mean? Maybe there are some that just can't get the vaccination. Mm -hmm. So right. I'm just wondering how, how does that, you know, make sense? If oh, okay. 89% um, of those who are eligible mm -hmm. are vaccinated, Sabrina. But we have to remember that there are a lot of young people here on island, those who are under 12 years who are not eligible, not yet because they haven't come out with recommendations for vaccination in children. And then there are those who remain unvaccinated. And we've just gotten some of those numbers. And in fact, there are about 32,000 children who are ineligible for the vaccine at present. So 32,000 susceptible children in Guam and about uh, almost 15,000 people who remain unvaccinated. So you put those numbers together, and that's still significant. That's, that is uh, nearly 50,000 people in Guam who are very susceptible to this virus and basically a, a, um, you know, a hunting ground for the virus to, to continue. And so that's where we're at. For as long as we have people who are susceptible, the pandemic will continue. But Doc, how much is a factor uh, with the, the people who took the vaccinations early mm -hmm. on, right? So we're starting to see a lot of these breakthrough uh, cases. Right. So how do we kind of like move forward and trying to, to vaccinate the large segment of the population that you just referenced while also trying to protect a lot of the people, especially the elderly, who's uh, the yeah. effectiveness of the vaccine may be waning? It sounds like yeah, we're, I mean, there's a lot. I, I, I think you're absolutely right, Chris. So I actually think we have three priorities for vaccination. The first is to continue to try and vaccinate all people who are eligible who haven't gotten it. Second priority is we have to be prepared to roll out the vaccine in children as soon as that becomes available. And the third is to really ramp up the boosters because, you know, Guam was one of the first to really start to proactively get uh, people in the community vaccinated. So there are many people who were vaccinated back in January and that's nine months out. And you know the data is saying that maybe you start to see the waning, they say it's six to eight months, but in fact, with the Delta variant, what some of the early studies are showing is that the waning begins at four months. So, you know, I think that was really interesting because if you recall what Dr. Ann put out was when they looked at the folks here in Guam who were having the breakthroughs, and they calculated how far out they were from their vac from their last vaccine. It was about four months. You're right. We just read that information yeah. off. That was in last night's JIC, right, Brie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, wow. It just uh, scary situation, um, Doc. I, and, and did you want to talk about those breakthrough cases uh, a little bit? Because sure. I know that that fuels uh, uh, some of this like vaccine hesitancy is where you have people 
who say, oh, I haven't got the shot, but so-and-so did, and they're in the hospital, or they're sick, or they died, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's figure it out, right? Um, number one, I think we should be expecting breakthroughs. They're to be expected. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. One, no vaccine is 100% effective uh, in the history of mankind and clinical medicine. There is no vaccine that protects 100% of the time. So you do expect uh, breakthroughs to happen. But is, um, are we a consistent milestone? What, what's the really significant milestone, right? Part of the confusion is we tend to lump everything together into this one milestone of infection. When, if you think about it, um, with COVID, there's actually at least four clinical milestones that you need to think about. The first is, can you prevent exposure? Right? So when it's just starting out and can you do something so that people are not going into environments where the virus is? And that was at the beginning of the epidemic, which is why we're, we were doing the lockdowns and the stay at home. That was the purpose of that. But what we found out was it's not practical to do that indefinitely. People do have to go out, they have to work, they have to get their food. So the second clinical milestone is can you prevent infection? If people have to go out in an environment where the virus exists, are there ways so that you can prevent them from getting the virus into their system, right? And so that's where the mask, the social distancing, the hand washing come in. And vaccination also has a role because it tends to lower your risk of infection by about five times. But that's not the only milestone. So there's a third one, which is, um, can you, can, if someone's infected, can you prevent them from getting severe disease, right? Because that's really the, the kicker there, because if you have everyone getting sick and getting to the hospital, your health system will crash. And so to prevent disease, this is where the monoclonal antibodies come in, right? So you, you're infected, but you still have mild symptoms. So you go get those monoclonal antibodies so that you avoid getting so sick that you need to be hospitalized. And then there's your fourth milestone, which is if you do get sick, can you prevent death? Right? And that's where things like the ventilator, the proning, the Regeneron, you know, the, the remdesivir, you know, those come in to help uh, with people to prevent dying. So there's actually four milestones, but the, and, and there's different interventions for each one. Mm -hmm. But the key is that there's one intervention that cuts across three of those milestones, and that's vaccination. Because vaccination reduces your risk of infection but it also markedly reduces your risk of severe illness. And if you do get sick, your chances of dying are much less as compared to an unvaccinated person. And that's really why vaccination is so, so critical because it's the one intervention we have that cuts across three of the milestones. Everything else just really addresses one, one phase. Um, and the idea is layering, you want to layer all of those interventions so that your protection is at the highest uh, possible level. Right. Doc, so when, when we talk about these different uh, milestones, right, and we just look at the numbers uh, being reported, I mean, just to play devil's advocate, uh, or maybe even just reasonable person, it doesn't seem like, given the high numbers, the deaths, right, the hospitalizations, it, it I don't know, people might look at this and say that it's not working. Um, I, I would beg to disagree, Chris, because if you if you look at the numbers, majority of those who are in the hospital and majority of those who die are still the unvaccinated or the partially vaccinated. And I think it's because people are, and this is the epidemiologist in me, I think, you're, I think people are calculating it wrong because what they're doing is what percent of people in the hospital are vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And that's actually not the right way to look at it because you're mixing your two mm -hmm. populations, their risks are so different. So what really ought to be done is the number of people who are hospitalized who are vaccinated over the total number of people who've been vaccinated in Guam. So you're comparing it to the right denominator. And then you contrast that to the number of people who are in the hospital unvaccinated uh, over the number of unvaccinated people. And if you do that, you'll find uh, that there's quite quite a difference. Um, it's about the metric. I think people um, maybe are not uh, calculating it appropriately. Yeah. Well, I mean, we just we just report the numbers as we get them, and they are broken down yeah. that way for, for the hospitalizations. But you're right. 
you can look at uh, a joint information center release and it'll say uh for example 34 unvaccinated 25 vaccinated right and you're you look mm -hmm. at that and you're like oh my god it's 25 people who are vaccinated but yeah, when you when you can yeah when you consider it's 25 people out of the 80,000 or whatever that are vaccinated and again Bree just had read that it's something like two percent right exactly it's it's actually a, over 121,000 people right, who yeah. are now vaccinated yeah. in Guam My bad. Uh, versus the 14,400 something who are not so there's a huge difference in that denominator and that's what you don't see in the JIRC report right. so it's so important to include the denominator in the um I, I'm just wondering, what do you tell people that um, that say, you know, I just don't want to get vaccinated. I just refuse to. What What do you tell them well, to try and kind of convince them why well, this no, is Sabina, important? Um, you do have to respect uh, yeah. people's ability to make informed decisions. And I think as a healthcare provider, uh, my role would be to answer any questions that they had, any concerns, using the best data that we have. Ultimately, people have to make the decision for their health, right? But it's important that they have the right information. And so it's very important, I guess, for healthcare providers to make sure they're not propagating misinformation or echoing, you know, things that are not really proven by the evidence. Um, maybe one, one thing that we also have to, to recognize is, yes, we all have choices. We have to be prepared for the consequences of the choices as well. So, so it's about uh, really weighing, uh, weighing those two against each other. Right. Uh, but it's very important to make that decision based on, on real evidence. Well, let me ask you just a hypothetical, Doc, right? Um, if, for example, let's say someone who is a very fit, younger person, mm -hmm. right, great shape, and, they, they, and you hear this a lot, you say, they say, oh, I'm very healthy, I don't need to take the vaccine, yeah. yada, yada, yada. Just give us, like, uh, specifically in that instance. What would you say? What would you say to those those people? Well, that we can say to them that there are young, healthy people who have died, and is that a risk they're willing to take? When you have something that you know can protect you, um, it's hard. You know, it, it can be tough when you're young. You feel very invincible, right? But sometimes personalizing the data with, with real stories and, and real cases can make a difference. Yeah, and one of the real stories I remember during the pandemic, I forget which family it was, but it was a case where, yeah, there's someone young, healthy. They didn't get sick, but they brought it home to their grandparents. Right, so there's also that side of it. Huh? Yeah, we've, we've lost uh, some, some folks in my family back in the Philippines and some friends, you know. And some of them are, are young. They're, they were, one of them was a young doctor who had just graduated and got it uh, as an occupational hazard. Very fit, a gym. He was also a gym instructor. So he was in good health, non-smoker. You know, he was eating healthy and doing all the right things. But at that time, there was no vaccine. And, mm -hmm. you know, we are so fortunate in Guam because the vaccine is so readily available here. But in the Philippines, it's a struggle sometimes to get the vaccine. At the beginning, even the healthcare workers, they didn't have access to it. So, you know, that, that, was, that was hard. That was hard to get over. Yeah. Um, such a tragic loss of life, really. And, and, you know, we have the intervention to prevent it. And so I think, you know, as we're getting a wrap up this interview because our show's coming to a close, but maybe because the holidays are right around the corner, we've got Halloween, we've got thanksgiving we've got christmas and we all know those are big uh times for social gathering um i, I guess just any um final words you have yeah well i think you know holidays are about love right and and vaccination is also in in my my view vaccination is love um the best way to spend the holiday is to be alive with your with your family <laughs> And to share the happiness and you know let's uh let's that sounds all right and That's something i could enjoy <laughs> yeah uh but doc realistic just give it to us real just no one here just you sabrina and i are we gonna get to have a thanksgiving a halloween a christmas like you know a semi kind of kind of normal one 
we will get over this, Chris. We will. Um, at some point, either we will all get vaccinated or the virus would have gone through everyone on the island. <laughs> that's, that's just viral dynamics. But we will get through it. And we have a choice, you know. Do we want to get through this by Thanksgiving or do we want it to continue to play out to 2023? And, and the pathway to freedom is vaccination. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Doc. Yeah. Yeah, you guys take care, okay? You too. Yeah, appreciate take your care, time. No. And we'll see you in a little bit. Anytime. Okay. Stay safe. Bye there now. you go. Dr. Okay. Annette uh, David. I like her delivery, too. Real. She's always been so sweet, man.